What's up, my friends? Welcome back to another video. And today is a special one because I'm talking with Joel Dolier, the orchestral mixing engineer. And this was a lot of fun. We covered a lot of things like um, overall balances, compression, uh, depth, reverb, uh, mastering, balancing, like all that great stuff. And uh, he, yeah, he, he really shared a lot of nuggets in here. So hopefully there's some stuff in there that you can really take out and start applying to your own mixes. And if you really want to go super in depth and check out an entire program that he's created called Mixing Cinematic Music, um, it's hosted on Master the Score. So you might want to check that out using the link below. It is an affiliate link, meaning that if you do purchase through the link, a part of your payment will come back to support me in the channel, which I do appreciate. But um, if you don't know hard feelings, but just so you know, that is there. And uh, yeah, it, it's a great opportunity to really just dive in super, super deep and check out everything that he does. But in this interview, we'll give uh, he, he basically shares an overview of his process and how he approaches orchestral mixing as a whole. So hopefully you enjoy that. So without further ado, uh, please enjoy my chat with Joel. What's up, everyone? So glad to have you back. And today we are talking with orchestral mixing engineer Joel Dolier, am I, hopefully I'm saying that yeah, somewhat exactly. correctly, and uh, so good to have you, Joel, thanks for being here, and um, yeah, I just wanted to, to talk about mixing with you, because I know you've kind of built this really nice um, niche for yourself in the orchestral mixing realm, and you have your YouTube channel where you share tips, and now you have this new course with Master the Score, so a lot of you, uh, sorry, a lot has been going on for you, um, but can you maybe share just a little bit about what kind of brought you into music, and especially as a mixing engineer, and maybe just catch us up a bit or catch us up a little bit on your background. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, first of all, uh, hello everybody. And hey, Chris, thanks for having me. It's great. Of I love to talk and no doubt about mixing. So yeah, uh, you, you know, my, my beginnings, it's funny because I think it's uh, like many people, it's epic music, you know, when you kind of go into orchestra music, there is a good chance you you first listen to Heart of Courage, maybe by Two Steps From Hell. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, you kind of start from there, you're like, oh, epic music, cool. So yeah, I started like that, you know, in around 2014, I guess. Yeah, the end of 2014. So I started with just composing like that. Mm. Uh, and then I kind of quickly transitioned into mixing around uh, 2016, I would say. I just found that when I was making tracks, I spent more time mixing than composing. So mm. I, kind of, I kind of just shifted towards that. And, uh, you know, then it's like, it started with uh, friends. They were like, oh, can you mix my track? And then some uh, my first clients, and then kind of grew from there, you know. And uh, mm. yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to be able to do that for a living. So yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> that that's great. Yeah, that's I fun. mean, especially I think for so many people, um, <laughs> being able to do uh, what they love full time is is a dream. And the fact that you're doing it full time, but and you're still enjoying it, uh, is is a big thing because I guess unfortunately a lot of people do it full time, but then over time it feels like a burden. So hopefully that that doesn't feel that way. Um, but know, anyway, I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, good. Let, let's talk about, you know, just the general overview of mixing. What are, I guess, how do you define mixing yourself? And what would you say are like the core basics of mixing in general that we need to know? Yeah, I think mixing, yeah. I mean, the, so it's a bit of a complicated answer because mixing is, is not just about clarity. It's not just about one thing, you know. I think it's about kind of enriching the vision of the composer or just helping represent everything in a, in a nicer way so i think when you do a mix you need to have like you need to have some kind of vision based on the composition and what the composer was trying to convey mm -hmm. and then it's a it's a mix of well, mix <laughs> a mix of <laughs> fixing problems yeah. kind of enhancing things um you know maybe like certain balance moves you might do might just be to enhance the clarity of the harmony so say uh, by default the composer kind of wrote a um, chords that when the orchestra recorded that or when he programmed that in with libraries like you don't just hear the voices at the at the right balance you know you maybe you just hear the lead too much or you just hear the bass line too much so you kind of have this control over the arrangement as well a little bit and how the, the harmony feels you know so it's not just kind of making things pretty and shimmery even though there is a part of that there is also kind of an, uh, an arrangement uh, embellishment phase and then you know uh, a sort of balance phase just to make sure that it's also going to be compatible uh, across many different source, I many different playback systems, so cars, uh, etc. So there is a sort of uh, objective technicality to it, mm -hmm. and also artistry because of how you're going to help um, the instruments. You know how they're going to poke out of the mix. If that makes sense. So it's many different aspects that you kind of need to balance out, and uh, there is a, a, of course a personal aspect to it, an artistic aspect, but also more objective. 
a technical aspect to it, I would say. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, especially mm. as an artist yourself, I mean, you, you know how important it is, again, to achieve that musician or composer's vision and also... Yeah. You know, and in addition to that uh, technical side, uh, you know, you make your own decisions there too. But um, can, can maybe can you walk us through like your personal process then a little bit? Uh, let's say you you received a new project file, right? Um, just as a very quick overview, what would you say is like your first approach? What do you do first, and then all the way to the very end product? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, I guess the first of all, you you have all your files, so preferably with no panning, uh, no reverb, no effects. Uh, unless it's like a, a production effect, you know, like a distortion or something mm -hmm. that's very important. So then you, you have that. Now, I think it's important to be organized, especially with the kinds of mixes I do. There is many stems, many tracks. Uh, actually, most people call it stems, but it's tracks. Stems would be groups of tracks. Mm. So you have to you have to color code things. You have to create groups and buses. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of evaluate what kind of session this is. Um, what the groups would make sense so for example if it's uh, if i have like a one library it's like the same library like css all strings i'm going to create a group for all css yeah. then maybe if i have uh, two different brass libraries i'm going to create two buses one for each library because i'm going to send different amounts of reverb and you know stuff like that yeah. depending on the library as well so i, I kind of make a plan uh, with the routing and the organization then i color code and uh, then only once I'm done with that, I can start mixing. Uh, so then, you know, there is some people have a very linear process. So first balance, then EQ, then blah, blah. Uh, I think it's good to do that, especially at the beginning when you're getting started. Uh, personally, I will do definitely a pass of balance at the beginning. But then there is a lot of back and forth between EQ, reverb, uh, balance, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. So... I would still recommend, you know, to kind of try to to organize things in order of importance. So, of course, balance is the most important because you, you want to hear everything relatively balanced. Uh, but then you need to address the EQ. But the EQ is also going to change how you feel about the balance. But if you cut a lot in the mid, for example, it's going to appear quieter. Mm -hmm. So then you kind of need to go back and uh, fine tune that. So, so you know, uh, then it's just a lot of fine tuning, trying to start with broad moves. And uh, eventually you end up with a mix, I guess. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Love yeah. that. Super short and concise. No, that's great. Um, wh what would you say is maybe specifically unique about orchestral mixing, though, versus, let's say, other genres mm. like pop or hip hop or something? <clears throat> yeah, so I think with orchestral mixing, what's more difficult? Uh, well, it's not necessarily more difficult because each uh, genre has uh, different aspects to it, you know, like... Uh, yeah. Uh, rock has drums, like you need to learn how to mix a drum kit, a drum mics, etc. So that's a different thing. But with orchestral, what you need to be careful with is um, how how the elements are going to poke through the mix. Because when you have sixty elements, you know, in a mix, even one dB uh, of uh, of balance or one dB of EQ is going to make a dramatic difference because there is a lot of masking. Mm. So you end up with this very difficult balance game. And I would say it's probably the most difficult genre to mix when it comes to EQ and balance, because just as I said, just one dB is going to change things. Um, and also there is always a temptation of EQing too much and uh, removing too much mids, for example, or, uh, you know, trying to, to create too much clarity. So you need to really balance out this clarity. It's a bit less forgiving when it comes to, to, to EQing and balancing compared to other genres. Mm. So I would say that's the most difficult part, you know, because when you EQ one element, uh, you're not going to hear much of a difference. Uh, like an orchestral mix will come from the additive effect of EQing all of these elements sure. and balancing all of these elements. And then you get, you know, the nice balanced sound. Mm. Uh, but there is so many things to do, like so many EQs to put yeah. that you can easily get lost. So I would say that's the most difficult part. Whereas in other genres, it might be more forgiving if you say you put the bass guitar 2 dB too loud uh, in, in the rock mix. I mean, it's fine. It's just a bit bassier. Right. Um, <clears throat> but if you just bury like an important line in an orchestra 2 dB too low, yeah, well, suddenly it's really lost. lose the melody. Now it's, it's gone. by every yeah, yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. But I would say that's that. Uh, mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I guess talking about frequencies though and balance in general, I mean, so the way I personally approach it is I, I kind of do the static mix with the faders and stuff, right? And I try yeah. to make sure everything's um, audible. But in terms of actual balances though, is there an objectively like correct way to? balance the frequencies in terms of EQ and stuff like do is you know reference tracks the answer for that or is there an objective number to reach for different balances or for like EQ no there's stuff? definitely no numbers 
okay. think it's um i mean it's just yeah reference tracks would be uh some of the most helpful uh-huh. uh it's a very <laughs> helpful way to work um but you know I, I think balance is really like an ear thing you need mm. to know Partly you need to know what an orchestra sounds like, but you also need to know when you want to stray from that a little bit. Mm. Uh, because, you know, um, if you make modern orchestral music, you're probably going to want something that's a bit more hyped up compared right. to a traditional orchestra. So you're probably going to want bassier tubas that have a, a bunch of sub-presence, mm. uh, especially in like trailer music and stuff like that. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, you need to, to create, to keep some kind of realism. So... Mm. It, it, I mean, there is two kinds of balance. There is the volume balance and then there is tonal balance. So yeah, I mean, of course, experience helps a lot and reference tracks help a lot. In terms of tonal balance, there is a plugin called uh, Tonal Balance Control by Ozone. Uh, you probably know this one. So this can be very helpful to figure out if you have too much bass compared to the mids or, you know, stuff like that. Right. But of course, it's you can't just trust these visual tools uh, 100%. So in the end, it all comes down to experience and knowing mm. what to, to listen for. That makes sense. Okay, it's good to know that you can, like, ultimately, it depends on your ears and what you're really going for. Because again, yeah. I guess mixing is like a, it's an art in itself, and it's not just a science, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess talking about uh, mastering then really quickly, um, how would you separate those two phases? Because I've, I've heard people say, you know, mastering is where you make sure that the, the mix sounds good on all the different systems, or maybe the volume is loud enough, etc. So how do you personally differentiate those two? Yeah, I mean, personally, <clears throat> for me, I would say mastering is almost like an afterthought because I don't rely on it at all in order mm. to achieve uh, like the sound that I want. Um, mostly for me, it's going to be a volume thing just to to boost the final level. And I'm going to do a little bit of EQ, you know, just maybe one dB cut here and there. And even mm. that is kind of a lot. So I used to be more to do dr more drastic moves with mastering. But nowadays, you know, I just don't rely on it at all mm. uh, to really achieve a good sound. I mean, there, is, there are several reasons. One of the reasons is if you do production music, you can afford your stems to sound the same as the master and uh, you want mm. the mix to sound as close as possible to, to the master. Right. Um, now, you know, if, if I put compression on the master, like glue compression, uh, I'm going to actually do that in the mixing phase and export uh, the mix through that compression. Right. Because I want to, to for me, it's like a mixing thing. You know, if, if you want the mix to breathe around the compressor, it has to be in, in the mix because... Of course, you could put more compression in the master afterwards, but you didn't balance your drums or your elements uh, during the mix phase uh, properly, like through compression, to just kind of crush it afterwards because you don't gonna know mm. how that's gonna sound. Like maybe, maybe you would have pushed the drums more if you had the mix through that compressor. So putting all your mastering compression at the very end without kind of mixing into it, yeah. I think it makes less sense compared to just mixing into it. So for right. me, mastering is just like maybe like 5% of uh, widening if the track can benefit from that. Right. Uh, maybe 1 dB each boost and cuts, and then trying to figure out the right combination of uh, limiters and clippers to achieve the volume that I want without destroying the mix. But it, mm. it's going to be very light stuff. Right, right. Mm. Yeah, I've heard the saying that the, the mix should be approached as if there is no mastering needed at all or something. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, well. I think when you master tracks for other people, it's different because yes. you're kind of fixing their mix in a way. Like 70% right. uh, seventy percent of what you're doing in there is like fixing the mix, trying to fix the mix. And then you do the final maximization. But if mm -hmm. it's your own uh, track, like if there is a, an issue, it's fixable in the mix, you know? So in the end, right. like the processing you would want to do would, should be very minimal on your own tracks. That's fair. That's fair. Mm. Yeah. Talking about compression, you had mentioned that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in, in orchestral music, at least in the more, I guess, acoustic genres, there's generally less compression going on just because you want to hear more of the dynamics of those instruments, right? But is there like a general approach you have for compression? Do you generally like to do it for the master or do you like to go really down to those individual tracks or does it entirely depend on the genre itself? Yeah, so I think in general, uh, uh, what, what we can say is that for uh, orchestra music, there is less full range compression. So that means like normal compressors that will just act on the whole frequency range, you know? Mm. But there is actually a fair amount of dynamic EQ that you can do. Um, and the reason is that it's kind of different uh, sources, you know. When you have like genres like, um, you know, rock, you're going to have lots of spiky acoustic guitars and drums. Then you, you most likely want to control that in order to kind of raise all these quiet bits and bring more meat into the music, you know, more decay from the snares, uh, more kind of sustain from the acoustic guitars and all that stuff. 
Mm -hmm. uh, for orchestral, it's a bit different because we are working with very wet, more distant sources, which are all by, by design less dynamic because there is mm -hmm. more tails overlapping, there is less close making. So as soon as you have less close making, you, you, you automatically end up with less dynamics because the more further away a sound is, the less dynamics you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So that's you're going to have another problem though, which is resonances. So less kind of mic micro dynamics like that, but, but more resonances. Uh, that means that maybe your bass is going to wobble a lot from uh, note to note because now you're more dependent on the room and the environment that your sound was recorded in. Mm. So you're going to have maybe some boxy mid-range resonances from the halls and that stuff should be addressed uh, mm. to get a really clean modern mix. But the way you're going to address it will be more focused on the problematic area. So it's going to be maybe like a dynamic EQ at 500 hertz. On the double basses, it's going to be like a dynamic EQ controlling that 100 hertz uh, resonance. Uh, just to kind of even out, uh, you know, the baseline without really crushing what's not necessary, uh, because if you if you kind of notice like um, in sustained instruments, let's say orchestral sustained instruments, they're always very consistent in the highs um, because you're kind of far away, and when it comes to the highs, the highs are not very reactive to the room because these frequencies, you know, they're more direct. They don't kind of bounce around as much as lower frequencies physically, mm. uh, because uh, low waves are longer, so they bounce around more in the room. Uh, that's just by design yeah. uh, but you're going to have more inconsistencies lower in the range so the way you approach compression is different uh, i think technically there is a, a lot of compression if you make like a modern hybrid orchestral mix mm -hmm. but it's just not full range compression it's more targeted in order to control things without ruining the the entire thing and uh you talked about dynamics before just to finish on that uh I think the orchestras can have a lot of macro dynamics. That means between like pianissimo and fortissimo, you're going to have all these, these, these dynamics, but there is less micro dynamics. So all the little spikes, you know, I was talking about all these little details. Yes, because of the nature of the sounds, you have less of them. So, you know, it's different types of dynamics, but uh, still dynamics. That makes sense. I'm going to have to watch that back over because uh, <laughs> there's a lot of gold <laughs> in there. Sorry, but... but... <laughs> no, no, that was good. <laughs> um, wow. Uh... I had to, sorry, I had something lined up. <laughs> Dang. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I think, I think generally that, that makes sense. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll watch mm. that over. Um, I think all of us have a lot to take away there. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, mic positions and reverb, let's talk about that for a second. So um, how do you generally approach adding additional reverb if the arrangement is a little more dry, right? Do you use one? Do you use two algorithmic convolution? How do you tend to layer those? What's kind of the process there for you? Yeah, so uh, for me, reverbs, you know, it depends on the source. Um, like the philosophy I try to, to have nowadays, and I think it, it works better, is not to rely on reverb too much uh, mm. when I have other options. By that, I mean, I'd, I'd rather have like a nice room recording, a natural recording, and right. not add too much reverb on top uh, compared to just running dry samples in reverb to try to recreate depth. Sure. So the reason is, I think reverb is kind of like a patchwork. Like it's, um, you know, it, it's just it's fake, you know, it's not yeah. as good as uh, really having the depth from a, a far away capture because you can't eliminate the closeness. You can't truly eliminate the artifacts of a close recording with a lot mm -hmm. of reverb. So I always, I always do a pass of mic positions if I, if I see that the source has uh, problems. So I will ask the composer, can we just listen to the mic positions here? Can you maybe just uh, turn off this close mic or we can I don't know, find a different balance of decatry and our tricks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So once I try to get the most out of the library, then I'm going to enhance that with more reverb. Um, so usually I'm going to use the same reverb for all the instruments, um, just different amounts. Mm. But at least I know that I have the best source possible. Now, sometimes you have dry recordings, you know, when you have like a live violin or live flute or whatever that you want to integrate in your track. Mm -hmm. In that case, you kind of have to use other tools uh, to recreate that depth. Uh, so what I do in that case is that I will chain two reverbs. I think many people do that. They chain a room and a hall. So mm. first you kind of try to simulate a mic position. Uh, you try to simulate like a decatry or a room capture mm. with a shorter room reverb, maybe around one second decay. Mm. And once you kind of have this first layer of depth, you kind of throw it, you send it into the hall uh, to really get that natural hall feel. So. You know, in that case, we're kind of using this in-between reverb, this in-between uh, room reverb as a mic position simulator because it's essentially just trying to match the, the other libraries more. 
Mm. So yeah, it's all about getting the source as nice as possible and then using the the least reverb possible to achieve the sound that you want. I would That's say. really interesting. I, I love that uh, that illustration about you know just using two reverbs, one as kind of like the mic simulation, right, and the other one yeah. as the hall. Mm. So is that what you would do then? If let's say you had a bunch of orchestral instruments where, like, let's say they only have close mic positions and, and you want to play some instruments further back and some leave them further up front. Would you use that technique then to push the, uh, I guess the more back instruments further back in the hall? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's definitely not an ideal setup. Uh, right. <laughs> ideally you want to, yeah. especially with orchestral ensembles, you want to capture yes. the ensemble and that means the room. Yes. But uh, if you'd have the choice, uh, then yeah, I, I would use a, probably like a even tight SP2016 Mm. or some kind of reverb that does room simulation well and then we just push back uh, the sound different amounts straight to create some kind of room unity and a stereo mm. field and then i would put everything yeah. in the hall yeah okay okay cool yeah i mean that was always you know, something i wondered about that's what yeah. mia pro does to some degree uh, uh, okay you know right. the vsl thing yeah yeah so this is kind of the same idea cool mm. yeah no that that makes sense that I, I can definitely think about that um what what would what would you say are some common amateur mistakes that you see people making in their mixes? Mm, well, I think it's probably too much processing because when you're just getting started, you don't have the ear to really dose the EQ and mm. um, the panning, so you end up with these mixes which are very unorganic, very bright, overly panned, right? Uh, and you kind of end up losing everything, like losing all the the soul of the instruments because. You know, by panning things too much, you can lose the room because you pan the, the wet instruments. Right. So if you over pan, you lose the room. Uh, then some people might over EQ, overly brighten the orchestra because they feel like, oh, it's too muddy. Mm. Uh, but then if you overly brighten something, maybe to try to match another genre, uh, even though it shouldn't be matched, yeah. then you're going to end up with something that's that loses its depth because as you raise too much highs, you also lose the, the depth, the distance. Uh, yeah. There is a, there is an equilibrium between distance, like feeling of depth and highs. So that's why they have to be boosted tastefully. Uh, you know, I boost a lot of highs in the orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, but it, of course, if you do too much, it sounds close and it sounds synthetic. That's just the nature right. of highs, you know? So, uh, you know, <clears> I think with time, people kind of develop um, taste and they, they are able to judge better how, how they should process things sure um, yeah that's the number one thing I, I hear honestly okay no that's totally fair i mean i guess gaining experience is, is certainly something to think about um would you say the best way to really start to get better is by listening to a lot of music and just use reference tracks etc do you have any beginner tips for people i would say yeah listen to reference tracks um and see you know, try to listen to, 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 so I like to kind of, I call this the box of reference. So generally it's going to involve a few things. I'm going to take like a very kind of natural darkish orchestral track. Yeah. Then I'm going to take a really bright kind of hyped up orchestral track, you know, and the things that sound good to me, that kind of my extremes. Uh, so depending okay. on what I'm mixing, I'm going to at least have sort of extremes, you know, between dark. So maybe something like uh, the Wonder Woman OST. Mm. you know the original movie uh, soundtrack and then the maybe how to train your dragon you know it's fairly mm. bright uh, the second movie so you take these two soundtracks and you kind of compare them so if something is very dark and moody and lots of sub the other one is very bright so then you have your, your kind of like a sum of your box but then the box has four corners right mm. so you're going to want to go into other genres as well i think it's helpful to go into edm maybe like very bright edm or k-pop so you kind of know what is a really bright energetic mix. You know it's not going to work with the orchestral, mm. but at least you can compare and sort of refresh your ears. Like if you want to feel what's the most hyped up mix that you could possibly get, mm -hmm. get some K-pop, I don't know, uh, Blackpink yeah. or whatever. Sure. And that's, that's like the, <laughs> honestly, it works. <laughs> that's like your Definitely. extremely bright uh, option. Right. And then you know something else, I don't know. So have this track that you know really well. It's not about the number of tracks that you use. It's about knowing them really well and having them really complementary. And mm -hmm. then you can listen to your mix and kind of feel where it's sitting and uh, how it like where it should make sense based on right. the composition. Interesting. I would recommend something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. So it's like you're you're choosing those extremes, but then once you have your or once you compare it to your own track, it's like you make little adjustments to try to fit that respective one yeah. you're trying to 
sound like. So I, I don't think it makes sense to use reference tracks as a goal uh, because uh. it's always going to be different. Like reference is not about a goal, uh, trying to match something exactly. Mm. It's about uh, creating this box of limits uh, so they can kind of hear where you are and reset your ears. Okay. So I think it's, it's better to approach it like that. Interesting. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, one kind of little specific question I find that I kind of approach. So when, when I'm working on a mix, let's say using CSS or cinematic studio instruments in general, yeah. right, they, they naturally have a lot of that sub like room frequencies that build up over time. And I feel like this is the case with a lot of scoring stages. They have like that hiss and stuff. Right. So, um, I, I guess, how do you kind of address that, that low, and to make sure that that doesn't build up too much. Is it just like a high pass or do you do anything special there to make it cleaner? Yeah, so, you know, I think the the issue with many stream libraries, um, not just many like low, even tubas and stuff like that, like mm. low stuff in orchestras, is that <clears throat> they wobble a lot. So that's what, what I was talking about before uh, with yeah. uh, the low frequencies bouncing around in the room. Uh -huh. So you end up with the, these dynamics, you know, and, um, this is kind of perceived as mud usually because when the, the bass note switches to a different note, you might get some whoa, whoa, you know, stuff that wobbles mm -hmm. like that. So you end sure. up with these very kind of muddy sounds or, you know, resonances around 200, 100 um, ish. And usually it's not that it's too much necessarily, but it's just that it wobbles. And the moment it wobbles, it feels muddy. Uh -huh. So what I would try to do is dynamic EQ uh, to just try to address the spikes. Or you can use plugins like Gulf Force as well. If you know Gulf Force, it's um, you know an automatic dynamic EQ for people mm. people who don't know. And um, you know if you really kind of focus on these spikes and compress them when they happen, then you're going to have a more even amount of bass, and it's going to be more predictable, and it's not going to feel as muddy instantly because uh, the, the tonal balance is going to be more even. You're not going to get this sudden unbalance, this sudden you know uh, bad ratio of mids to bass. Mm. So. Of course, it's natural to some degree. You don't want to squash it 100%. Yeah. But trying to address that with dynamic EQ first before just cutting all the lows might be a better option so cool. that you really address the, the problem when it's happening, I would say. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's cool. I'll definitely consider that. Yeah. Um, really quickly, what's the difference between a mm -hmm. dynamic EQ and a multiband compressor? <laughs> well, the difference is like, it took me a while to understand this one. Yeah. Then. <laughs> But uh, there's not a lot of difference. The difference is that a, a multiband compressor will use uh, full crossovers. So it will divide the sound uh, with full high pass and low pass filters internally to, to kind of create this separation. Okay. And uh, yeah. then you have the more traditional controls of a compressor. So attack, uh, release, uh, knee, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, dynamic EQs could technically have that. Uh, so it's not really a good comparison to say, oh, dynamic EQs don't have that because some have all the <laughs> attack, release, and even, uh -huh. I don't know if they have knee but they have almost all the same controls. Okay. But I would say the main difference is that the dynamic EQ will usually uh, just be like a bell filter automation, essentially. Okay. So it's, it kind of has the same controls, but it, the way it's separated internally is different. And that will also allow you to do more, uh, I would say, dramatic processing because dynamic EQs mm. can be very sharp. Oh, uh, okay. This is just like a cut automation. They can be very sharp. Mm. Uh, whereas multiband compressors, because it's full on high pass, low pass filters, uh, it's more difficult to keep this transparent and have them like extremely sharp. So you will uh, notice that multiband compressors usually don't like are not going to be able to be as surgical. Interesting. Um, okay. But I would say it's more like a workflow thing. Technically, you could do most of the same things on the um, multiband compressor compared to a dynamic EQ. Okay. But it's good to have the um, like the dynamic part of your EQing in the same interface as the EQ for workflow. Right. Uh -huh. uh, and for the kind of resonance control, uh, you don't really need to grab a separate multiband compressor. If it's just okay. to control resonances, uh, I would stick to dynamic EQ. Okay. Okay. It's, it's good to know that, you know, mo most of the stuff that overlaps, that's good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess walk us through the, like the, the new course then. I mean, there, I know there's a lot of stuff in there. So what's kind of the general approach of this course? What have you tried to do with it? And what can we expect to dive into <laughs> it once we get into it? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I think I, I try to to blend like the more practical aspects of mixing. So like the more visual aspect that, so like mix the constructions, that's, you know, the my, my big thing. Uh, many people do that, but I think it's the best way to learn because you just see how a mix is done. You know, in every mm. track you have uh, all the plugins used. So, so, so that's good. But I also have a series of uh, theory videos at the beginning. So all the theory that you need to know in order to really understand what's going on in the mix deconstructions. Mm. But of course, this have a, a bit less context. So I think it's important to have this blend between all the technical stuff 
you know, with explanations, and then the context, how does this actually work in the mix? So that's why I have the, the first part of my course, which is all the theory the videos. Mm -hmm. There's like 30 of them. Uh, and then, so we're gonna get to the mix transactions, but then I have another thing, which is the how to EQ videos. So the reason is that uh, when it comes to orchestral instruments, uh, you have lots of common pain points, I would say, uh, okay. like say between violins or uh, even like you know tubas or whatever from different libraries. You will often notice things that are going to be similar, moves that are going to be similar. Mm. So I wanted to give people some kind of direction. Uh, it's nothing very precise, you know, but it's more like some areas to watch out for in order to better know how to approach EQing a certain orchestral instrument. Because mm. I think when you're begging now, like it's easy to say use your ears but it's not going to be very helpful you need right. some kind of push in one direction and then with experience you're going to know how to um those that eq how to know like recognize the problem frequencies mm. but at least it's, it's enough to help you get on the right track you know so yeah. these videos are very short and they try to walk you through uh all these pain points in, in orchestra instruments and things to consider mm. so then i have a, a part on the sound design because i try to kind of uh, explain as well how to mix synth and integrate synth in um, in an orchestral mix and also the more creative aspects of mixing because I think it's important nowadays for cinematic music you know the composers have to to know how to do synth you know how to mm -hmm. blend synth it's not just about orchestral right <clears throat> and then I have yeah the mix deconstruction so I think that's the most important part because it really shows how to put everything in practice and how it all sounds in the context of a mix so you know, I try to really, in this course, the big thing was I try to really diversify the type of, uh, of track that I showed you. Mm. So you have a uh, live orchestra, you have live orchestra that mixes with samples, and the samples are actually kind of 50-50 with the live orchestra. Yeah, right? Then I have like a trailer music track. I have a more a softer like TV music style track uh, that has also lots of sound design elements. And uh, yeah, I also have like a, a very traditional a full orchestral John Williams style uh, mm. track made with libraries. So, you know, I try to kind of show everything. Yeah. And uh, of course, many things overlap. You know, you know when you mix orchestral music, you, just because it's a different kind of subgenre, you're not going to make completely mm -hmm. different moves. But at yeah. least, you know, there is little tips and tricks in there that are specific to every track. So, yeah, try to show uh, as much stuff as possible. So that's, that's kind great. of how the course is laid out. Love it. Yeah. And I love the fact that you stress, like, th these are, you know, general guidelines and you're just trying to give this person you know a certain direction to follow um it just stresses that you know music is kind of a it, it's not always objective right like there there are yeah, guidelines yeah. to follow but at the end of the day you you go with what um i guess yeah i would never tell people like use these settings for this like it doesn't work, I guess. <laughs> right <laughs> but at the that, same time at the same time yeah. when you're completely clueless like if, if i can help you speed up a bit like Go, go a bit more towards the right direction i right. think you can give directions you know like I, I, when i was younger uh, like six seven years ago yeah. i was watching uh i'm acting like i'm old and stuff now <laughs> i was watching <laughs> we're at that like, point yeah how to mix drums videos and you know this yeah. how to mix drums videos it really helps me figure out okay how do i do a compressor yeah like your kick yeah. so of course as you grow you realize that some of these tutorials that you maybe you watched in the past were not always applicable but right. at least it helps you a little bit so that's for sure that's the point for sure yeah. for sure yeah and and i i believe um you had mentioned that uh owners of your original course have like an upgrade path to this new course right and i think people some people were asking like what's the kind of the difference between those two um are you able to kind of clarify that for yeah sure us? well uh, my first course it's a, it's a bit different because it started out as a trailer music mixing course so it was mm. very oriented towards uh, hybrid stuff um and the new course, I really try to, you know, show as much stuff as possible. So it's mm. way more generalistic and about cin like cinematic music overall. Um, so, you know, the, the difference is also quite massive in terms of the content. Mm -hmm. Like in terms of the lesson videos, it goes way more in depth now with the new course. Uh, there is also more mixed deconstructions, uh, more hours of content. So, you know, it's just more stuff overall. Uh, also, even the basics are just explained in a, in a more straightforward way, you know. Mm. Uh, you, you know, you grow as a person, you grow as a mixing engineer, you grow. So I, I think I managed to make stuff that's more clear, more well laid out, even for the basics. Mm. Um, and then, of course, there is a lot more techniques, uh, you know, more, more details, more, yeah. just more stuff all around. Great. Now, of, of course, you know, uh, in a few years, things haven't changed drastically. We still mix <laughs> with EQs. We right. Still, 
mixed with reverb. So uh, there is stuff that's going to overlap between my old course and my new course. Uh, so I don't want to, to just uh, make people pay the whole price if they already have my old course. So I have a 50% discount. Uh, I actually reached out to everybody who bought my previous course. But if you disable the marketing emails, you might not see that. So anybody right. who, who got my old course, you can get the new one 50% off. I try to make it a great deal. You know, Even if you removed all the lesson videos, all the basics, you still have seven mixed deconstructions. <laughs> there you go. For, for 50%. So there you go. It's no brainer. You're here first. Yeah, no, that's no great. Brainer. That's great. Yeah. Well, definitely check out um, the, the courses down below. Um, I, I had a chance to start going through it and it's, it's really rich with stuff. So um, uh, thank you. It's Been worth so it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, well, Joel, thank you so much for jumping on, man. Um, I, I appreciate it. And mixing is one of those arts that I think confuses many people. So it's always nice to have um, a voice specifically dedicated to this genre of music. So thanks again for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye. All right. See you. Bye-bye. All right, my friend, thank you so much for watching. Again, I really appreciate it. And hopefully you found a couple nuggets in there that you can really start applying to your own mixes right away. Uh, he's super knowledgeable, as you can see, and has a lot to share. So um, I definitely appreciate him coming on today. Um, if you want to check out more of his stuff, by the way, he has a YouTube channel as well. I also linked that down in the description so you can check out his channel for uh, mixing tips and tricks there. And again, if you want that full orchestral mixing course called Mixing Cinematic Music, it's a brand new course at the time of this recording, and uh, you can purchase it. Um, if you want to go super in depth with his material. So that is there in case you are interested. But anyway, again, thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it. And I'll catch you in the next video. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye.